How you doing tonight? You well? Good. My wife made me a bunch of tea with honey in it so I wouldn't be hoarse. That's what that is if you're wondering what I'm drinking up there. I really don't like it. <laughs> Sometimes we have to do things we don't like. So, anyway, you look happy tonight. Did you have a nap today? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you took a long one, didn't you? Yeah, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> she won't be sleeping during the sermon. <laughs> in your bulletin, did you see those, uh, I, I don't know how many got turned in, the uh, BBS slips, did you turn that in? I hope that you did turn that in. If you didn't, then fill that out. Just write your name. If you're not sure where you want to work in Bible school, just put your name on there and we'll find a place for you. And uh, we always have plenty of places for you to work in Bible school. Well, uh, let's bow our heads, ask God to bless in the uh, service tonight. Dear Lord, we're grateful to you tonight for meeting our needs. We're thankful for the good service that we had this morning and for the visitors that we had. And Father, we pray that you'll bless in this service tonight. And uh, use it for your glory, dear Lord. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We are glad to have you here with us tonight. And uh, anyone here for the first time at Liberty Baptist? I, didn't, I was having a meeting back there, and so I didn't get a chance to shake everybody's hand. Anyone here for the very first time tonight at Liberty Baptist? Well, we're glad to have each one of you. The choir is going to sing for us. stand and sing number 21, He is Lord. Do you believe that tonight? Amen. He is Lord.
seated. The usher's going to come receive the offering tonight. I had a, a letter from uh, the skeletons there, uh, uh, missionaries in China, and uh, they're now overseeing uh, four different evangelistic outreaches there. And in one month's time, they had over 80 people attend these outreaches. Isn't that great? Amen. They've had, uh, and according to this letter, they've had three people make professions of faith. And so praise the Lord for the job they're doing. That's, a, uh, that's great. And, and you know, I found a story. It's interesting because it's about a lady in China. And uh, it's an interesting story. And the, the title of the uh, article says, Woman's Hidden Life Savings Crumble into Pieces. Let me read the article. And this, this is a lady in eastern China. When an elderly woman in eastern China recently dug up her buried, it's a hundred thousand yuan, which is uh, equal to $15,600 U.S. money. It was her life savings. She found that the banknotes crumbled into pieces when they were handled. This was actually in the... Uh, the South China Morning Post, uh, and it was actually a story that was in their newspaper. Four years ago, she placed the money in a plastic bag, put it in a metal box, and buried it under her kitchen floor. But when she dug it up to help pay for her son's wedding, it was a, a crumbled mess. A banknote expert at the People's Bank of China said, there is little chance to redeem the ruined banknotes. And so that reminded me of that, the verse in the Bible there in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, where it says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Amen? She lost it all, but... Uh, Everything that we give to the Lord, every single cent that we give to the Lord, we know that uh, God's going to multiply that. He, he blesses us here, but in heaven, my friend, it'll be for all eternity. Isn't that something? Amen. Let's bow our heads, ask God to bless in the offering tonight. Dear Lord, we're thankful that we can give tonight. We're thankful for jobs, and we're thankful for uh, being able, Father, just to be able to work. And we pray that uh, you would just bless our people. And, Father, help us to lay up treasure in heaven. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Draw me near. Last song for tonight before the message. You can keep your seats on this one. Number 375. I am thine, O Lord. I have thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I love to Yeah. 
The children be dismissed. We're, we're not having Patch of the Pirate, but we're having Kids Club on Sunday nights now. We have different families that will be taking that Kids Club every Sunday night. Looks like we got a lot of boys, huh? We're taking our Bibles and turning to Revelation chapter 11. On Wednesday night, I'll be speaking from Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. To have friends, you must be friendly. Amen? Amen? <laughs> you need to come hear that message on Wednesday night. To have friends, you must be friendly. We're going to study that passage, great passage of Scripture about uh, being friends and having friends. And so I hope that you'll come. I, I think you might learn something, and you can learn how to make more friends. And so you come on Wednesday night as we study that tremendous passage of Scripture. And then, of course, next Sunday morning is Father's Day, and I'll be preaching a message, The Influence of a Father, from Proverbs chapter 20. And uh, so we'll be talking more about that in a few moments. But Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. If you can stand with me, go ahead and stand. <clears throat> we'll be reading these verses. Beginning with verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord 
and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. I think it's interesting there. They're not singing, but they're saying. Did you notice that? They're not singing, but they're, they're saying. And the four and twenty elders, anytime you see the four and twenty elders, that represents us, the New Testament Christians, that's us. So when we're looking at the twenty-four elders, that's what we're going to be doing, because we'll be in heaven at that time, and we're going to be doing those things. So, uh, and the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks. O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. <clears throat> and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. And so that verse number 19 is a, a great verse there because some people debate whether or not there is a temple in heaven, and the Bible says that there's a temple in heaven right there. And so uh, I think that that ends that. And so we're not going to be, you know, I'll mention that tonight, but that's just another, I mean, we, we preach these messages, we could preach probably a hundred other messages when we look at these things, you know. But we're going to be looking at the response of heaven to the blowing of the seventh trumpet. We've been waiting for the blowing of that seventh trumpet, and we see the response in heaven. Here we see the response that's going to take place in heaven uh, at the blowing of that seventh trumpet. And I want us to look at this tonight. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, I pray that you would bless the preaching of the word of God. Your people have come to hear from heaven today, tonight. And Father, I pray that they would. I pray that, Father, you would instill within us a desire to see your coming to look forward to your coming. Someone even tonight, just a few moments ago, said they're looking forward to the coming of the Lord. And dear Lord, may we all look forward to your coming, but until your coming, may we occupy till you come, and may we be serving you until you come, and be faithful to you until you come, dear Lord. Bless the preaching of your word tonight, and we thank you for these that have gathered here in the house of God. And Father, I pray that we would leave this place rejoicing in the great salvation that we have, and the coming Savior. Now, stir our hearts tonight, and I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. A little boy was praying, and he prayed this. He said, Dear Lord, he said, If you can't make me a better boy, don't worry about it. I'm having a good time just the way I am. <laughs> Father had been gone for three weeks on a business trip, and uh, a mother had uh, given her little daughter a bath and put a clean white dress on her. And she said, now your daddy's supposed to be coming home today, and so you've got to keep this dress clean. And uh, you want to be clean when your daddy gets home. And she said, Okay. And so she wore that dress all day long, that white dress all day long, and, would, and kept it clean. And at the end of the day, they got a call from her daddy, and he said, I'm sorry, but he said, uh, I'm delayed, and I'm not going to be home till tomorrow. And so uh, the mother took the white dress off the little girl and, and hung it up in the closet, and it was just as clean as it was when she put it on. And the next day, she gave her a bath, and she put that white dress on her, and she said, now your daddy's coming home today, and so you'll want to keep that dress as clean as you can. You want to be nice and clean when your daddy gets home. She said, yes, Mama. And she waited all day, and she kept that dress just as clean as could be. It was white, a white dress, kept it as clean as could be. And he called, Father called at the end of the day, said, I'm sorry, but I've been delayed, and I'm not going to be home till tomorrow. <laughs> the mother took that dress off, hung it back in the closet. And the next day, 
Uh, the little girl got up. She gave her a bath, put that white dress on her again. She said, now you got to keep it clean. Your daddy's supposed to be home today. And, and she said, okay, mama. And she kept that dress as clean as could be. And her daddy came home that uh, afternoon. And he said, my, what a clean, white, pretty dress. Wow. She, he, you look so nice. And the mother said, well, the only reason she's kept it clean is because of you. He said, what do you mean? She, she said, well, she's never kept a dress clean for three days in her whole life. <laughs> it's only because of you that she kept that dress clean. You know what? She was waiting for her daddy. She was looking forward to her daddy. And I thought about that, and I thought, my, we're looking for the coming of the Lord. We ought to keep ourselves clean. Amen? Amen. We ought to keep ourselves clean, waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will, won't we? We will keep ourselves clean and right with the Lord, looking for His coming. In this passage of Scripture, we see the response in heaven to the blowing of the seventh trumpet. These are trumpet judgments that have been, that every time one of the trumpets sounded, there was judgment upon the earth, and we've been waiting for this seventh trumpet to sound, and we're going to look at the uh, the response in heaven to what's going to take place in heaven. Now, this is what's going to take place in heaven concerning uh, the, the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Now, of course, we know when the seventh trumpet sounds, there will be seven bull judgments or vile judgments that are going to be poured out upon this earth. And that's going to lead to the uh, Christ coming, and uh, the, the battle of Armageddon and then Christ setting up his millennial kingdom here upon the earth. We're looking forward to that kingdom, aren't we? Amen. We're looking forward to that time when we're going to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ for a thousand years. It's hard to imagine a thousand years reigning with the Lord. It's hard to imagine a thousand years, you know. Time is, is going by so quickly for me. I, I think to myself, my, time is just going by so quickly. Seems like just yesterday we just started in the ministry, and, and my, all these uh, years have gone by, and uh, I'm looking forward. I've been looking forward to the coming of the Lord the whole time. You know, I kept thinking the Lord's going to come. And you know what? He could come tonight, amen? He could come before we finish the message. He could come, and we need to still be looking and anticipating the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never lose the excitement about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to look at three key responses in heaven to the blowing of the seventh trumpet. First of all, the first response of the great voices in heaven in verse number 15. And the, angel, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So we see, first of all, the great response or the response of the great voices here. Now, uh, I've read people say that this is a, a great choir singing in heaven. Of course, I never see where the angels are singing. You know what? Uh, but they're always they're talking and they, they speak, but I don't see them singing. And, and, uh, but this says that they're saying. What are they saying? They're making an announcement. They're making an announcement that the kingdoms of the earth or of this world belong to Christ, and he's going to come and claim these kingdoms. He's going to come and claim the kingdoms when he returns. And uh, that'll be, of course, at the millennial kingdom. He's going to set his kingdom up. At the, at the end of the tribulation period, Christ is going to come. And there's going to be great victory. Victory finally. Remember when Satan offered Christ the kingdoms of the world? Remember that? He offered Christ the kingdoms of the world, and if Christ would bow down to him, over and I'll remind you about that there in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 8 and 9. And again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth, uh, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Oh, the audacity of the devil. <laughs> I mean, just think, folks, if he would try to get Christ to do that, what he's going to try to get you to do, huh? If he was going to, he tried to get Christ to bow down to him. He's offering him the kingdoms. Of course, Christ refused that. He refused his offer, didn't he? <laughs> you know why? Because the kingdoms already belong to Christ. Amen? 
They already belong to him. Some people have the idea that they don't belong to him. My friend, they belong to him. He's just waiting to come and claim them, amen? They're already his. <laughs> Jesus died upon the cross. He paid the price and he returned to heaven victoriously, the Bible tells us, and, and this is part of his inheritance. In Psalm chapter 2 and verses 4 through 9, He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. That's Christ, amen? It belongs to him. It's his. He's going to come and claim it. It's already his. It's wrong. It's incorrect to assume that he's not reigning today. I'm telling you, Christ is already reigning, amen? He is king of kings and lord of lords. Let me give you some verses. Jesus, in Hebrews chapter 7, in verses 1 and 2, Jesus is the king of righteousness and peace, the Bible tells us. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being interpret, by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is the king of peace. Christ is the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Not only that, but Jesus is enthroned with the Father. Even now, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Jesus is enthroned with God the Father even now. He is king of kings and lord of lords. Amen? <laughs> he is. He, the, you know, the Bible says that he will reign until he defeats all his foes in 1 Corinthians 15, 25. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The Bible says he's reigning right now. Amen? He is the king of kings and the lord of lords. Jesus rules over the spiritual kingdom even today. And uh, he will rule over the nations of this world. The Bible says with a rod of iron, he will reign. And we're looking forward to ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's king of kings and Lord of lords. We used to, you know, I remember that song. We, uh, we just sang it just a few weeks ago, The King is Coming. I had a guy tell me one time, well, we shouldn't sing that song until the millennial kingdom. You know what? We can sing that song because Jesus Christ is the king. Amen. <laughs> He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords already. We don't have to wait till then. He still, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is in control. And uh, we're, we're so glad that uh, he is in control of everything. And one day he's going to triumph over this world. But uh, you know what? We can go to him no matter what our circumstances are. And he can help us, amen? The Lord can help us. It doesn't matter what your circumstance is tonight. The Lord can help you in that circumstance. The Lord can help you get from underneath that. Because he's king of kings and lord of lords. He can certainly help you, amen? And he will help you. I mean, he helps me every day. <laughs> he helps me. I start my days out asking, Lord, help me today. I'm going to need your help. I already know I'm going to need his help, you know it? <laughs> I know I'm going to have some run-ins. I know I'm going to need the Lord's help. Is that the way you are? I get up in the morning, and I say, Lord, I'm going to need your help today. <laughs> Every day it's that way. You think, well, you'd have one good day, you know, and something's not happening. Well, <laughs> you know, something happens every day to me. <laughs> every single day. I just ask the Lord in advance. I'm asking in advance for your help, Lord, because <laughs> I'm going to need your help today. Boy, I'm looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what victory we will have at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a great God of victory. He can help us. I was, we went to the, uh, the home going service of my brother-in-law. and Boy, you know, everything went well on the flight there. Uh, I, I, it's been a, a while since I bought tickets online. I did that, you know, had everything lined out. We got to the place. Josh took us over to the airport. Everything went. We walked in there and uh, into the Allegiant Air Terminal. We went in there. I hate it that they call it a terminal, you know, and I just don't like that, but <laughs> kind of scares me a little bit. 
I wish they'd called it anything but that. But nonetheless, we went in there, and we're dressed up because we knew that we're going to fly there, and as soon as we got there, we were going from Indianapolis, and we're going to drive straight to the church and have the viewing. And so we're dressed up, and I'm dressed in a, in a suit, and Martha's dressed up. And, you know, those people were so kind to us and so polite to us, and we went into the Allegiant place there. We walked right in there. And the, there were two guys, security guys, and they said, you're the best dressed people in the place. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you very much. And uh, I had an opportunity, pulled out a track, and was able to witness to that guy. Then we sat down there, and it wasn't long. I mean, uh, we went out, to, they called us, went out there on the tarmac and got on the plane. And on the way out there, there's a, a, another security person standing out there. And she says, well, you're the finest dressed people here today. And again, I said, thank you very much, and handed her a track, you know. We got up and went again to the plane, got up in the plane. We climbed up into the back of the plane. There at Allegiant down there, you, you, you actually climb up, you know, you, you just climb up into the plane. I climbed up into the back of the plane, and there's a lady standing there. She goes, why, don't, aren't you dressed nice? I said, well, thank you very much. Gave her a track. <laughs> Probably should have been given $10 bills or something, you know, for saying nice things like that. But everything went very smooth. We sat in there. I read my book on the way there. We got there. Went, got off the plane. Got my car. And, you know, everything was just working like clockwork, you know. We got there. Drove straight to Indianapolis. Went for the viewing. And, and uh, it was the family. I mean, half that town came, to, came through that viewing. That's the way those small towns are. You know what? They still do that. And half the town, everybody knew him. And everybody's coming. Preachers knew, knew him. And they're coming. Everything worked, went well. It just went very well. And, and uh, we're driving back and forth. I mean, the funeral was there in uh, Georgetown, Illinois. And Martha, of course, she's from Hoopston, Illinois, sweet corn capital of the world, I'm telling you. <laughs> and uh, her brother, he was so kind, he got us an efficiency to stay at. And so we stayed there. But you're talking about an hour. It's about an hour between that place. And so we drove down there, you know, and the next... Day was the funeral, and that was late, very late. I mean, by the time we got back to that place, it was very, very late, and I don't even know what time it was. Uh, you know, my stop, my clock just stopped running. It was so late. But anyway, uh, uh, the next morning we went to the funeral, and we had to drive back to Georgetown, which is an hour away. We're in Hoopston. We drive an hour there. That that uh, home going service lasted probably over two hours, and my. My nephew, who's Jerry Silver, who's running that thing, he said, well, it's going to last about an hour. I looked at the schedule. I said, this is no hour. I said, I've done enough of these. I've done hundreds of these, and this is no hour, I'm telling you. He said, well, it'll be about, I said, it's not going to be an hour, I'm telling you. It was over two hours. <laughs> he said, you're right. I said, well, I, I, when I saw all the choir singing twice and the preachers are singing, you got two preachers preaching? Let me tell you, that's an hour right there, you know? <laughs> well, we went there, and then, then he was buried down in Hoopston. So we had to drive all the way back down to Hoopston for the burial. And after the barrel, they're having dinner back in Georgetown. We drove all the way back to Georgetown. And after the dinner, then we had to drive back to Hoopstead. <laughs> Every, but, you know, everything went well. The next day we went to church at Martha's Church where she got saved, First Baptist Church. And they asked her to play in Sunday school, play the piano in Sunday school. We're sitting out there. Can you play, Martha? Miss Martha, can you play? Go on. I'll play Amazing Grace. <laughs> she played Amazing Grace. Then they asked her, can you sing in the choir? She said, I'll sing in the choir. And a lady fell in the basement, hurt herself, and so the choir didn't sing. They asked Martha to sing in place of the choir. So she sang in place of the choir. Just brought tears to my eyes. It was something, and everybody, it was great. Everything went smoothly. Then we had a big family meal on Sunday afternoon, and, uh, and we, then we went to church Sunday night. And after church, after the church service, we came back, and everything, you know, everything's, I said, boy, this is so smooth. Everything's so smooth. And then I went to get my tickets for, the, for Monday to come home, and they wouldn't give me my tickets. I said, what's going on? I'm, you know, you, you uh, what do you call it, check in? I said, I'm checking in. N nothing. 
And I said, what in the world? Why won't they let me check in? It's an hour, you know, 24 hours, you can check in in 24 hours. Why won't they let me check in? So um, I look over that, I look over my paperwork, and they put the wrong date on it. They had me coming back in July. <laughs> Isn't that something? Everything's going fine. You're breathing nice, you know. And <laughs> I said, July? <laughs> Whoa. And I said, it's not July, it's tomorrow. <laughs> so there I am, you know. And I'm getting on the phone. <laughs> to call. Have you ever tried to call anybody on one of those airlines? Oh, my. Oh, boy. That was a, over two hours. I think they were timing me in the other room. Anyway, finally I got a hold of somebody and I said, this is not right. I said, I know it was right on the computer, but it didn't print out right. And I said, I, did, I thought for sure it was, you know, I guess I didn't pay attention to it. And, and they felt sorry for me. You poor little guy. And they said, we'll correct that, and we'll get you on the plane tomorrow. I said, oh, thank you so very much. But you know what? The whole two hours I was on the phone, I'm praying. You know what? I am praying. I was praying the whole time, asking the Lord to help me. I, well, that's what I'm saying. I need the Lord's help, amen? <laughs> Isn't it something? Things are going smooth. You think, oh, wow. I thought, well, I'm just going to go back after church. I'm going to type. I'm going to get on the computer, do this, have my tickets, and then I'm going to eat a, some dessert. My sister in law had made this, I don't know what it was, but it was marvelous, whatever it was. And I'm just going to enjoy myself, put my feet up for just a few minutes. You know what? No. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Did you ever feel that way? Not me. <laughs> There's some other guy. <laughs> I thought maybe for just a few minutes I could put my feet up. I've been riding by planes and cars and never sat down <laughs> one time. You know, Isn't that the way it is? Amen. We can trust the Lord. Victory's coming. There is going to be victory. We see finally there's going to be victory. The response of heaven to the blowing of the seventh trumpet First of all, we see the response of the great voices in heaven. Then we notice, here's our response. This is us. In verses 16 through 18, the response of the 24 elders, that's us. They represent us. This is what we're going to be doing in heaven after that seventh trumpet sounds. Look at what it says in verses 16 through 18. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God in their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, and they uh, uh, should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name shall a small and great should destroy them which destroy the earth. Now, this is interesting. So we see these 24 elders who represent the New Testament church, our age, us. Two things, two ways, two things they're going to do in heaven. Number one, the Bible says they're going to fall on their faces and worship the almighty, eternal God. That's what the Bible says. And uh, we see... Uh, God's attributes mentioned here. God is omnipotent, O Lord God Almighty. Oh, that word almighty means omnipotent, all-powerful. God's power is all-encompassing. Do you understand that? It's all-encompassing, the power of God. There's nothing like the power of God. Then number, verse 17, which are and was and are to come. God is eternal. God has no beginning. He has no ending. My friend, the Bible tells us that. Uh, uh, he has always existed, and he always will exist. God is eternal. That's the kind of God we serve. We ought to be glad for that. 
Then look at verse 17 there. Because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. God is sovereign. God is omnipotent. God is eternal. God is sovereign. And uh, that word sovereign means he's in control. He has absolute power and authority over the earth. He's absolute. So first of all, what are we going to do? We're going to fall on our faces and we're going to worship God, the almighty, eternal God. And then number two, we're going to praise him. In verse number, uh, in beginning with verse number 18. So we're going to fall down and worship him, and then we're going to praise him for what he's going to do in the future. What's he going to do? Well, look at this. Number verse 18, first of all, the nations will be angry at God, and the nations were angry, the Bible says. They're going to have a belligerent attitude toward God. They're going to unite together, and they're going to fight against Christ at the battle of Armageddon. You would think that they would have more sense than that, wouldn't you? Well, they're going to fight against Christ at the battle of Armageddon. Number two, the wrath of God's going to fall upon them in verse 18. And thy wrath is come. Nothing this world has ever seen will compare to the wrath of God. Nothing. God's anger is a holy anger, is a holy righteous indignation. This world has never seen what it's going to see in that day. Number three, the dead will be judged in verse 18. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. This will take place at the end of, of course, God's prophetic program, Revelation chapter 2. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. And to the angel of the church at Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas uh, was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. And so uh, we see that those are going to be judged, that those uh, without Christ are going to be judged at the end of the God's prophetic program at the great white throne judgment, they're going to be judged. Then the godly will be rewarded in verse 18. And thou, and that thou shouldest give reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. This is the judgment seat of Christ. When after the rapture takes place, then we're going to be caught up to heaven. And uh, I believe that we're going to be judged before we ever go into heaven. I believe we're, uh, we're going to meet the Lord in the air, the Bible says. And when we meet the Lord in the air, I think we're going to be judged right there before we get into heaven, the third heaven. God is going to judge us. You say, why do you think that we're going to be judged? And the Bible says in Romans chapter 14 and verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the judgment seat of Christ. As Christians, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of our lives. Why is that so important to take place at that time? Because, my friend, we have to be ready when Jesus Christ sets up the millennial kingdom because we're going to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And so that has to be taken care of before that time. We're going to be judged. We're going to stand before the Lord. So when he sets his kingdom up, we'll be ready to rule and reign with him. We're going to know what our responsibilities are going to be right then. Then in verse number 18, the destruction for the destroyers. And should it destroy them which destroy the earth. Now, this is not referring to the environment. 
you, you might laugh at that, but there are some people, I've got a book back in my office that somebody sent to me, and they think this is referring to the environment. Now we're to take care of the environment. That's not what that's talking about. This is talking about those who pollute the earth with their sin. That's what it's talking about. They're going to, those, and should it destroy them which destroy the earth. It's destroying the earth with their sin. Now, the question you might have, you say, wow, we're going to be praising God, and we're going to fall down and worship God, and we're going to be praising God because God is going to judge the earth. <laughs> how, are we, how come we're going to be so happy about that? Well, we're looking at heaven's perspective here. When we see things, we're looking from earth's perspective, aren't we? We don't see the whole picture, but in that day, we're going to be looking and we're going to see the whole picture. So we can't even understand it all right now, but in that day, we're going to understand it. We'll understand why, and we will praise the Lord. It's like, have you ever gone into a room, someone's telling a, a story, a, maybe a humorous story, and you go into the room, you get in there after they've told the story halfway through, and and they to get to the punchline, everybody's laughing, and you don't get the story. Because <laughs> you didn't hear the whole story. But when you hear the whole story, then you'll understand the punchline. And my friend, we don't know the whole story, do we? <laughs> but in that day, we're going to know the whole story. And we'll get it, and we'll understand it, and we're going to rejoice in that day, the Bible tells us. So we see the response of the 24 elders, we see the response of the great voices in heaven. Then we see the response of God. Look at verse number 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and, a, and, and great hail. So God opens heaven. And in heaven is seen the temple. And in the temple is seen the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Covenant, you have a gold jar of manna that was saved from the children of Israel when they wandered in the wilderness. You'll have Aaron's uh, rod that budded in that Ark of the Covenant. Then you also have the stone commandments, the Ten Commandments on the stone in the Ark of the Covenant that's there in uh, the temple. And I'm going to explain why that's all important in just a moment. But on the top of the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat, and the mercy seat is now turned into a judgment seat. The mercy seat is where they would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice. And of course, uh, I think and, and I've heard a, I heard a preacher preach about this one time, and he said, that's where the blood of Christ was sprinkled in heaven, you know, paid for our sin. <laughs> but what is so important about seeing heaven opened up and seeing the Ark of the Covenant, because it, it's a testimony against those who've rejected Christ. First of all, it's a testimony against those who've rejected God's word, amen, the, the law. There in the Ark of the Covenant represents the Word of God. They've rejected God's Word. And then they've rejected the mercy of God. We have a merciful God. And they've rejected the mercy of Almighty God. His blood was shed for our sin so that we could be saved. And they've rejected His mercy. They've rejected His Word. They've rejected His mercy. And God will judge them. And that's why that's important. I believe that's why... He points that out in this passage. Then notice the last part. It talks about the thundering and lightning and voices and hail and earthquake. What is that all about? That's about the seventh bowl judgment. Those are talking about the, it's, it's looking forward to the judgments that's about, that are about to come and <clears throat> the anticipation of the bowl judgments. You go over to Revelation Chapter 16, are you with me tonight? You're looking at me. Are you with me? Amen. Am I getting too far ahead? Sometimes I know this stuff and I'm going, man, are you getting it, what I'm saying here? I don't, does it make you excited? It makes me excited. 
I just get excited about the Word of God. <laughs> Revelation chapter 16, verses 18 through 21. And there were voices, here it is, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in re in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of a wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men great hail, there it is, hail out of heaven, every stone upon, about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. <laughs> Man, they're cursing God. God's judging them, and they're cursing him. You'd think they would repent, wouldn't you? That's how wicked man is. Man gets, his heart gets so wicked that he won't even repent. He won't even turn from his sin. You say, what in the world's going on in the world today? Man has become so wicked, hasn't he? He's so wicked. Heaven is the source of judgment of unbelievers, vengeance upon unbelievers, as well as the blessings for the redeemed. God would rather bless us than judge us, wouldn't he? Amen? He would. Years ago, um, before I started this church, and even when I started this church, I was a principal of a school. And I, I never wanted to be principal of a school, but I was principal. People came into my office when I had to bring a young person in my office. They were either in trouble or I was going to reward them. You know what? I'd rather reward them. <laughs> I'd rather just give them something than to have to punish them. Back in those days when I was a principal, that was in the days when, they, when you used to use uh, corporal punishment and you used to paddle the students. You know what? Today, you, they're afraid to do that because churches will be sued if you do that and schools will be sued if they do that, so you can't do that. In fact, fact of the matter is, after I left that school, a couple of years afterwards, they paddled someone and the church got sued as a result of that. And so, uh, you know, it used to make, you, you say, I feel just as bad as, as you do. You know what? I did feel as bad. I hated it. It ruined my whole day if I had to paddle someone. Some of those kids were bigger than me. <laughs> they were big. <laughs> and uh, I, did, I just didn't enjoy that at all. I'd rather give them a treat or something, you know what, and, uh, than to have to paddle them. It just, it ruined my day. My, I'd come home, and my wife would say, well, now, where's your smile at? I said, I left it back in my office, <laughs> and I had to paddle that kid back there. <laughs> I just didn't like it, and, uh, and I didn't. I just I didn't like that part of it at all. But you know, I think that God, our Heavenly Father, He'd rather, rather give us a blessing, amen? amen? He wants people to be saved for all eternity. He'd rather uh, bless us. He'd rather for people to be saved. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering. To us we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord wants to save people. He'd rather save them. So the response in heaven to the blowing of the seventh trumpet, that we see the great voices there in heaven, see the twenty four elders which represent us, we see the response of God. My, it's all leading up to the coming of Christ. Amen. It's all leading up to setting of the millennial kingdom. We're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. We're looking forward to that. We ought to want to keep our lives holy, waiting, looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know when he's going to come. He could come tonight. Amen. We want to keep ourselves clean and holy and pure till Jesus comes. I like the story about the old preacher that he got sick in church very, very sick, and they took him to the hospital, put him in the hospital, and he, he was so sick, he was sick unto death, and they didn't think he was going to live, and they ran tests on him, and they were trying to help him, and his son was there with him. The next day, his son came in, 
And his father was sitting there in the chair, and he'd put his suit back on. He had his suit on, he had his tie on. He's sitting there in the chair. <laughs> and his son came in there, and he said, What in the world are you doing? He said, Put that gown on, take that suit off, put that gown on, and get back in bed. You're a sick man. You need to get back to bed. What are you doing with your all dressed up, sitting there in the chair? You ought to be in bed. What are you doing? His dad looked up and he said, I want to go home. I want to go home. I'm ready to go home. It wasn't long after that he went home to heaven. <laughs> but you know what? He, he got all dressed up because he wanted to be in his best when he went home to heaven. Amen. <laughs> He just wanted to be in his best. You know, we all want to be in our best. We all want to be our best when we go home to be with the Lord. If the Lord comes back, we want to be in our best, don't we? See him. We want him to see us in our best when the Lord comes back for us. We need to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. In the light of Christ's coming, are you living a more godly, holy life? In the light of his coming, are you living a more godly, holy life? Or you say, you know what, I want to make a commitment to live a more godly, holy life for the Lord till he comes. I want to make a commitment to live a more godly and holy life before Christ comes. Here's my hand. I'm making a commitment to the Lord. Slip your hand up all through the building. I'm going to live a more godly, holy life until Christ returns. I'm going to do it by the grace of God. Pray for me. Here's my hand. I'm making a commitment to the Lord. Here's my hand. Thank you very much. Hands all through the building. Hands are still going up. You see, I didn't raise my hand a moment ago, but here it is. Pray for me. Anyone else? I didn't raise it here. Thank you. Amen. Anyone else? Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Anyone else? I didn't raise it a moment ago, but I want you to pray for me. Here's my hand. Would you pray for me? Anyone else? Before I pray, I'm going to have a word of prayer. Include me in that prayer. If Christ were to come today, let me ask you this. Are you ready for his coming? Are you sure you're saved and on your way to heaven? Are you sure you're saved and on your way to heaven? Or would you say, you know what? I'm not sure about that. I can't be positive about that. But would you pray for me tonight? I would like to pray for you. Say, I'm not sure that I'm on my way to heaven, but would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up? Then put it back down. I'll pray for you tonight. Anyone? Maybe you know someone, and they claim to be a Christian, but their life is not what it should be. And you say, you know what? I'm going to pray for them tonight. They're not. They're going in the wrong direction with their life. Would you pray with me for them? I know some. They're going in the wrong direction. Would you pray with me for them? Slip your hands up all through the building. Pray with me. I know some that are going in the wrong direction. Amen. I'm going to pray with you. I know that's a burden on your heart, and I'll pray with you. And, I, and I'll encourage you to come and intercede on their behalf. You know, when we humble ourselves before God, I think that it adds a lot of weight to our prayers, don't you? When we humble ourselves before the Lord, I'll invite you to come in just a moment. Kneel here at the altar and pray for them. Pray for yourself. Ask God to help you to live a holy, godly life until he returns. Dear Lord, be with the invitation time tonight. Dear Lord, you've seen the hands of the people making a commitment, saying, listen, I want to live a more holy godly life until Christ returns. I'm going to be looking for Christ's return and I want to live a more holy, godly life. And when Christ comes so that he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And then, dear Lord, there's some here tonight. They have a burden for someone. That, dear, dear Lord, they're, they're going in the wrong direction. They claim to be a Christian, but they're going in the wrong direction. Dear Lord, I know that you can redirect them and I pray that you will. Pray that you'll turn them about. Bring them back to you. Bring them back to serving you. Bring them back to the place, Father, of real blessing. You, you want to bless us, Father. You don't want to have to judge us. You want to bless us. And yet we get out of uh, sorts, dear Lord, and we're out of uh, the place where we should be. We're out of your will. And, Father, I pray that you'll bring them back to the place where they'll be in your blessing. Now be with the invitation tonight. Bring your people here to humble themselves at the altar of God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand to your feet. God spoke in your heart. Why don't you come and pray tonight here at the altar. I think that God likes, to, like us, likes us to come to this altar and need 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 to this altar. And